Hello and welcome back. Now, at some point in your life, you're probably going to need to speak to a lawyer. And if you're unlucky, probably more than once. And if you already have spoken to a lawyer a few times, I'm sure you've come across what we call legalese. It's that way lawyers have of speaking. If there's a way of making things more complicated, they tend to find it, don't they? Sometimes it's really hard to understand exactly what a lawyer says. For example, in witness whereof the parties hereunto have set their hands to these presents as a deed on the day, month, and year herein before mentioned, which in plain English means the date. Lawyers spend a lot of time organizing and going over documents, which is why the law is an excellent candidate for natural language processing, or NLP. And that is exactly what our next speaker is here to talk about. He is Alvaro Barbero, chief data scientist, and he's here with us right now. Alvaro, great to see you. Thanks for joining us here and coming in person. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Great. A little bit nervous, but well, it's my fourth time, I think, I'll speak things, so I'm really happy to be oh, here again. Yeah. You're, you're, a ve <laughs> you're a veteran, uh, Alvaro. I'm yeah. sure you're going to be absolutely fine. We're all very uh, much looking forward to what you have to tell us. So when you're ready, I'll let you take it away. Okay, great. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, natural language processing and in particular natural language processing in the law sector. And, well, before starting, let me just tell you a brief story. So this is going to be a story about going places. And what I mean by going places is, well, uh, since the beginning of mankind, you have to solve this, let's say, transportation problem. You want to go somewhere else. You want to go from point A to point B. So how do you solve this problem? Well, the main solution, or let's say the most common solution for most of the history of mankind was, has been, well, you want to go there. Well, you just walk there, right? And it has been like that for most of the history since the advent of the Homo sapiens. But fortunately, like uh, 5,000 years ago, uh, we developed new methods to solve this problem. You will try to reduce the physical effort you need to do to go to somewhere else by putting that effort into a different being. So for instance, uh, we invented horse riding. Uh, well, unfortunately for this animal, it means that it will do the effort that we will normally do. But fortunately for them, this changed again in the 1886, where the first automobile was created. And now we are placing that physical effort we need to move ourselves, no, not into another living being, but onto a machine created by technology. So this machine is powered by fuel, and now the effort we need to perform, the physical effort, is almost zero. Now, the interesting thing is that this trend is starting to change right now. Because in the near future, what we will probably have in our streets will be self-driving self cars. And the change in the trend here is that now we don't need to, we are not creating this technology to reduce physical effort, but to reduce cognitive effort. And that means that when I want to go somewhere else, I don't have to think of all the little details of the plan I want to do the route. I will just tell my car, I want to go to this point, and the car will do everything for me. The physical effort, the thinking of the driving, all the decisions. So this is the trend that we are seeing in most artificial intelligence applications. Right? The point is, uh, of this technology is no longer to reduce physical effort, but to remove the need to do this kind of menial task, repetitive tasks, tasks that are uh, require mental efforts, but are not really so useful or interesting for us. So this is the point, and this is the application that we try to develop for the legal sector. So this application uh, was all about trying to create a map of all the information that pertains to a card case. And I'm going to describe to you what this, this system was about and all the, uh, let's say, lessons we learned from this project. So first, let me give you a brief disclaimer. So this system I'm going to talk about was a real system working with real court cases. But of course, I can't show you any real documents here uh, because of legal reasons, you know. I, everything you will see here are either uh, public legal documents or mockups. But you will still get a nice idea of the kind of uh, documents we had to deal with, right? So this is the Mapa del Expediente project, which is the Spanish name for court case map project. This was a joint research and development effort between my company, IIC, 
and Garrigues, which is one of the biggest players in the legal sector. And the main effort, the main point here was to create an artificial intelligence solution which will remove this cognitive effort from the everyday lawyer's work. So let's build a system that will try, will input, will receive a lot of different documents from the same court case, somehow organize that information, extract the relevant data, and plot a map of the whole court case so the lawyer can have uh, a better day going through all the information and looking for the relevant data. Okay, so this is the team at IIC that uh, worked in the project. You can see well, it's a diverse team with different profiles. We had people from data science, uh, computer engineering, computational linguistics, experts in graph visualizations. So it's because of this diverse team and also because of the help we got from Garriga's lawyers that we were able to build this solution. Right. So like every big project, everything started out by drawing everything in a napkin, right? You know, every big project starts like that. You get an idea, you draw it in the pub in a napkin, and you start making the project out of that. Well, the thing is, I would like to say this is a true story, and we had this napkin in our secret mission in our company. Well, unfortunately, it's not like that. Actually, what we did is I draw this diagram in a cheap application in my laptop, but still you get the idea, right? We started with something very, very small, just a diagram of what we wanted to build. You can see here a small uh, graph in which you can see the relevant people in the card case, the relevant companies, how they are interconnected through different court case files and the kind of files that we want to identify, right? So this was the core idea. And well, since we have been working natural language processing techniques for a few years already, we identified which were the key uh, tasks we needed to solve to achieve this. So mainly they were first, classify the documents into different kinds that will be useful for the lawyers. Also, reading automatically through all these documents and finding out the people and companies that were mentioned in these documents. And then after we gather all this information, create a visualization that will mix everything and will, will be helpful for the lawyers. So yeah, if you think a little bit about this and you know a little bit about natural language processing, you might realize like, well, this can't be so difficult, right? It's about document classification, name entity recognition, and then plotting everything together. So we had a team of experts in all these fields, so we said, well, this is going to be easy peasy, right? We just need to apply all these fancy deep learning models to the data and everything will work out. Well, let me tell you something. Reality happened. So what this means is we found a lot of obstacles we had to overcome. So let me tell you just a brief of them. So first, we expected the data to be as nice as this document you can see here. Again, this is not a real document, it's just a um, public document, but you can get more or less an idea of what the real documents look like. So we expected something like this, right? You could just uh, take the text out of this nice PDF document and work with that, that raw text. Well, unfortunately, the reality was more or less like that. So you will have documents of, uh, let's say, varying quality. You will have tilted pages, uh, markings, uh, somebody who wrote something in the margins, post-its, and all this kind of stuff. So we couldn't just get the text from there. We needed to apply optical character recognition techniques to get the text out of these documents. And now if you have ever worked with OCR methods, you know that these are not perfect. And we soon realized that even if we expected to get nice quality text out of the documents, most of the time you will get something like this. So you will have wrongly identified characters, you will have uh, text that should be in a margin and was embedded inside the main text. So we had to build machine learning models that were robust to these errors. Now, the next uh, hindrance we found might surprise you. When we were just going through the pages of all these real documents, we found out that sometimes you will get a page like this one. So what the hell is this? <laughs> so there is a blank page, but it's not entirely blank because you can see some markings there. Well, actually, what's going on here is that maybe somebody decided to print out this document as one-sided documents, and then somebody else decided to scan back these documents as two-sided documents. And of course, you will get a blank page for each one real content page. 
Sometimes it was easy to identify like these ones, but sometimes you will get other pages that had no real, no real useful information like covers or some kind of document splitters. And we had to develop a general technique to remove this data because they were noisy pages. Now, going on with the problems, this was another surprise for us. We actually expected that when we get the data for a court case, we will get one PDF file for each one of the documents that was involved in the case. But actually what we found out that is that we will get some PDF files that were really long, about 100 or 1,000 pages even. And we thought, well, maybe these are legal documents. They are really so long, but actually not. What will happen is that somebody scanned a stack of different kinds of documents all together into the same PDF file. So we have to develop some method to actually take a look at two pages and question ourselves, well, are these two pages part of the same actual document, or it just so happened that somebody scanned them together? So we have to develop a method to detect this and split documents. And finally, and this was probably the largest obstacle to apply machine learning techniques, all this data we had was completely unlabeled. So this means we cannot apply any supervised machine learning method here. And well, you probably know of unsupervised machine learning methods, but let me tell you, these methods work sometimes. And in this context, they weren't going to work because the problem was very difficult. So the solution here was to create our own training and testing data set out of this unlabeled data. So you can see here that we had many more tasks than what we initially planned, but we still went out to the project. And let me show you a brief overview of the whole system. So the system works like this. So you will get all the PDF files pertaining to a card case. First, we will run the optical character recognition methods. Then we run some kind of heuristics to remove those transcriptions for the OCR that were of poor quality, because we actually realized that very poor transcriptions were adding noise to the system, and it was better to just remove them completely. Then you will get a bundle of three machine learning models that will first remove non-informative pages from the data, then split each one of those PDF documents into their real individual documents, and finally classify each one of those actual documents. Now in parallel, we have another machine learning pipeline that will take the, only the useful information and apply an um, an entity recognition model to find out uh, persons and organizations appearing in the data. Now, that was, of course, not going to be so easy because you will often find that the same person will be spelled differently in the same document. Maybe because it really is a different spelling. Maybe we have the surname in some documents and not in others. Or maybe because you have these OCR mistakes I told you before. So we had to run some heuristics again to group and clean those entities. And then with all this extracted data, we could finally build a visualization showing all this information together. So let me go into the details of each one of these pieces. So first, how did we build the training and testing data? How did we build the corpus? Well, Garrigues was so kind as to provide us with all the data pertaining to six different court cases. We kept one of those as the test data set and the rest for training. And you might think that six cases are not so large, such a large quantity, but let me tell you that these cases were really huge in amount of paperwork. So you will, ha you will have more than a thousand documents and even around 80 gigabytes of data just belonging to these six core cases. So we started with that, nothing was labeled. First, uh, we made some annotation guidelines to define which kind of document classes we wanted actually to annotate by our machine learning models. So this was a joint work between our experts in computational linguistics and the lawyers from Garrigues to find out which kind of automated classification will be useful for the lawyers and then look out in the documents if we could actually uh, annotate the documents in that way that will be useful. We started by a taxonomy of 13 categories of documents, but in the end we realized that there wasn't enough representation from some of these classes, so we merged some of them together, and in the end we ended up with uh, eight different classes. So once we have this formally defined, we started manually annotating the data. So again, we had two annotators in our team, and they will independently go through a lot of different pages 28,000 pages, annotate all of them manually to tell which kind of document 
was should be assigned to each one of those pages. Now they will uh, mix their annotations and solve the conflictive cases in this in which we had mismatching annotations. But we found out that about 80% of the pages uh, will get the same labeling by both experts. So we think that was a good enough annotation. It took a lot of time, as you can imagine, but we obtained a nice training and testing data set for this classification problem. And then about the name entity coordination, we had to repeat something similar. We selected uh, the kind of entities we wanted to detect. At first, we were interested just in people and companies, organizations, let's say, but we also added the location entity to these annotation guidelines because this might seem trivial, but it's not always so straightforward to identify whether something is a place or an organization. If I tell you about the Spanish Ministry of Justice, you might think, well, that's trivial, right? It's an organization, but it's also actually an, a physical building in Madrid. So you ha need to have some more details in the instructions about how to do this. And this is just one case. There were many more conflicting cases. So again, we defined these guidelines together with the lawyers from Garrigas. And then after having these formal annotation guidelines, we went through all the job of annotating 500 different pages. Now, this time the amount of pages was way smaller, but just because annotating uh, entities is way more difficult. You can't just uh, have a glimpse at the document and know what it is. You have to read through all the words in the document. Still, we'd got an annotator, an inter-annotator agreement of about 83%, which is still quite good. And then we had our training and testing data for this problem. So now we have our data set. Now let's talk about the machine learning models. So focusing on what happens when you input one PDF file into the system, what happens is first we run it through the OCR method. Then we will have a transcription, let's say the raw text for each one of the individual pages of this document. Then we'll have the first machine learning model that we take a look at each one of those pages and remove them if the model decides that they contain not useful information. Now we have a first branching of the machine learning pipeline, which will partition the document into the different sets of pages that perform the actual real documents. Remember those documents that were stuck together, right? We are going to split them. And then we have the classification model, which we will assign a label to each one of those actual documents. In parallel, again, we will have the name entity recognition model, which will annotate the entities, persons, and organizations appearing in each one of those pages. And then we will join this information with the output of the partitioning model to obtain entities at the document level. After all these heuristics I told you about, about cleaning entities, grouping entities, and so on. So let's go into each one of these models in a higher level of detail. So the first model, informative versus non-informative is actually quite simple conceptually. It's just a binary document classification model. So we can train it with the data we actually labeled manually, and this will tell us which pages we need to remove. Now, the partitioning model is not so simple because here we are solving a non-standard natural language processing problem. So we have a very long document with hundreds or thousands of pages, and we need to find out in which points we need to split the document into a new set of documents. So the way we solved this was to transform the problem into a binary classification problem. We will create a model that will take a look at one page and the next page in the document and ask the following question. So does this new page follow the current document? We train the model to solve this question and when the model answers no it doesn't, we will create a splitting of the document just at that point. Right, after that we can run the document classifier model and this is conceptually more easy. We just select the splits that were created by the previous model, analyze all the pages there, and assign a label in this taxonomy we created of eight pages. And finally, the name, the name entity recognition model is also quite a standard. Just analyze a page and f mark out where the entities are. Just bearing in mind all these heuristics I told you about, but the core idea is that. Now, what's inside these tiny little robots I have been showing you here? So what are the real machine learning models? Well, of course, if you know about natural language processing, you might have already guessed. They are language models. So I have been talking about language models, I think, for the past two years at this conference. So you might be bored already. But if you don't know them, let me tell you. So the key idea here is that when you want to solve a very complex natural language processing task, you cannot just do it straightforwardly. 
but you need to do is split the problem into different tasks. So the first task is to create a model that kind of, let's say, understands the structure of your model. But the model does actually is to learn what is the distribution of words that is most frequent in your, in your language. Let's say the English language or the Spanish language or whatever language you're building your model for. And then once you have this general language model for a, par for a particular model of a particular language, you will perform the second task, which is about fine-tuning that general language model into the tasks you want to solve. It might be document classification or entity detection or whatever. So this way of working has been very effectively for the last two or three years. The first method to actually show that this was a very nice idea was the BERT model for the English language. And this model is openly available. So you can just take that model and uh, download it. It's freely available on the internet. And just run the fine-tuning step. So half of the work is already done. There is a lot of models that are available for the English language, but unfortunately, there are not so many models for the Spanish language. So when we started this project, there was only just a single uh, language model for Spanish that was good enough. This was the Beto model created by the University of Chile. And we actually tried that model for this project, for all the machine learning challenges we had here. And these are the results. So we compared more classic natural language processing methods against using this Beto model for the Spanish language. You can see the classic methods in this slide as the blue columns and the new language model methods as the orange columns. And you can already see that there is a significant improvement, especially in those problems that are considered harder. So finding out which pages are informative, that's very easy. There's not such a large difference. But when we go to harder and harder problems, the difference between models is quite significant. For the entity detection, we didn't even try to use the classic methods because they were very hard to apply to this problem, and the language model seemed to work mm -hmm. very well. OK, so you have seen all the path here, right? It identifying all the problems, the new problems that appeared when we were solving the actual project and then solving each one of them using different techniques and applying the latest advances in natural language processing. But now the question is, and we might ask Bert this question, so are these results good enough? And what Bert might say to this question is, they are never good enough. We have to do better, right? How can we do better? So we developed the following idea. This is the main way of applying language models I just described. So you pre-train your language model for general data from that language, and then you find you need to a particular problem. We actually added a new step here, because the legal uh, domain is very specific in the kind of wording and expressions it uses, even if you are talking about the same language. And the key idea here is, well, let's take a general language model for Spanish, and fine-tune it to the legal Spanish, which is a particular kind of Spanish. And then we can apply that method to different tasks in, in this project. So how we did perform this? So first, we gathered a large data set, a corpus, for Spanish legal administrative documents. We gathered different kinds of open source data to, to obtain this, about 8 gigabytes of documents. We ran significant uh, processes to clean this data, to duplicate this data, and so on. And in the end, we end up, ended up with about three gigabytes of data, about uh, half a billion words, which is not such a bad corpus, right? And we've performed this domain adaption uh, procedure in two steps. So first, we use all this corpus we gathered to adapt the beta language model for general Spanish into what we call legal beta. So it's a beta language model specialized for the legal domain. But we had another corpus we could use, right? All the court cases that Garriguez provided us. So we performed a second adaption step using all this data. And with this, we obtained what we call the Garriguez beta language model. And the key insight here is that this last model has seen the data with all the mistakes produced by the OCR. So in this way, we are making the model robust to these errors we will find in the real data in production. So here are the results we got. And you can see as a green bar, either 
the legal veto or Garriga's veto, whichever works best, when we applied it to the task I described before. So you can again see some advantage here of using this uh, domain adaption step. We also tried uh, these problems with an openly available language model for the Spanish uh, legal uh, language, which is, uh, was made publicly available this summer, which is called Robert Alex. And well, unfortunately, the results weren't so good. So maybe because of this reason that uh, we had to adapt the model to the OCR data. So it seems that this custom-made fine-tuning and domain adaption step work very well. So as you can see here, we can actually go to the further step of incorporating new techniques in the state of the art of natural language processing, and they collaborate to produce a better solution. So where are we standing right now? Well, the journey still continues with this project. And what we want to achieve is a simple system that will take all the PDF files from a card case and produce a visualization like this one. This is just a mocap, but you can already get the idea. So we would like to, we would like to draw an actual map of all the people, companies, and documents that are related in the court case, and how they connect to each other through different documents. So maybe the lawyers can use this to get some interesting information. Of course, when you go to a real court case, this graph will be huge. So we are still defining with Garrigas how we can present this in a way that is useful. And actually, we are incorporating this into the Processa tool that the Garrigas has. This is a tool we created also together with Garriga some years ago, which aims to allow the lawyers to search for data in structured data files, like uh, PDF documents again, but also audio transcripts and so on. So uh, this is the project I wanted to share with you. Uh, you can see that going from the love, well, from the let's say from the lab to the love. So going from the actual experiments we will do with language models to the real application in an actual project involves a lot of different hindrances, but still all these fancy deep learning methods you can find around are useful and you can apply them in a real project. So I hope you learned something from these uh, lessons we have been sharing here. And well, maybe let's see you again in big things next year. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> I forgot something really relevant. This is the talk I wanted to give, but uh, since I have, I think, five minutes left or so, yeah, so I wanted to tell you something else. So as I said before, last year I was also present here at Big Things, and I talked about, um, let's say, interesting project we have been working here. This project was called Rigoberta, and the aim of this project was to produce our very own language model for the Spanish language. So the aim here was to use these five key points to be able to produce this model. So use a very large training corpus, place a lot of focus in the cleaning of that corpus, also use better training hardware, better neural architectures from the latest advancements in natural language processing, and apply these domain adaption ideas I described before and that we actually apply for the legal domain. So the timeline of this project has been two years long. We started in two years ago. Last year at Big Things, I presented the alpha version of this, which had some interesting results, but we weren't still quite yet. And today I can say that we have completed this project. We have this language model in their 1.0 version. And let me share you very quickly some interesting facts about this. So as I told you, one of the key points here was to use a very large training data set. We use the spanning annotated corpora, which is the same corpus used for the Beto model. But we also added two huge open sources for uh, web crawls of the Spanish language, OSCAR and MC4, and also our very own data set, which we crawl for uh, different media outlets. We also try to incorporate the latest advancements in, in deep neural networks for natural language models, which were the usage of the divert architecture. You can see here in this superglue challenge, that the divert architecture was the first model to achieve a performance over the human performance. And right now, it's in the third position in this ranking. But let me tell you, when we decided to use it, it was in the first position. So this is the architecture we use for Rigoberta. And of course, we wanted to test how well this model will work. So we compared against the three models that we think right now are most representative of the Spanish natural language uh, community. 
Beto is the one I just described. We also have Maria, which is a joint project between the National Spanish Library and the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and also the Bertin project, which is a community effort to create a language model. I have to say, the Maria version we use is the one that was released in the summer. It's based on the Robert architecture. Just last week, a new architecture was released, so we were really had the, didn't have the time to do all the comparisons properly. But here you can see some of the results. So just to have a fast interpretation, each line is a different PILI and uh, natural language processing task, and you can see a star marking which model has the best performance. So you can see that Rigoberta seems to be performing very nicely in many of, well, almost all of the data sets, sometimes by a small margin, sometimes by a large margin, but we are getting very interesting results. And let me also say that we went to the extent of running what is called an MNG test for a statistical difference. This is a, a test that will tell you if there is enough statistical significance that a model is good, better than another model. And we have been able to check that Rigoberta seems to be better statistically than Bertin and Beto. So I just wanted to share this with you very nicely. This is an interesting piece of news for us. And uh, well, we plan to introduce this new Rigoberta language model in all the projects we are performing, not just in this project by Garrigues, but also into different kind of fields in which uh, natural language processing can be applied, which is health, uh, maybe finance sector, and so on. So now for real, I'm not tricking you anymore. This will be the end of my talk. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. If you don't have time to question right now, you can see the links to my social media in the end of that talk, and you can just ask me later. So thank you for listening. That was great, Alvaro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Isn't Again. it uh, ironic in a way that we're talking about natural language processing and lawyers don't speak in a very natural way at all? So <laughs> I think maybe what you're coming up with here is an unnatural language processing model. Well, we can say that uh, every domain has the different way of speaking. The same goes true for uh, health sector. I mean, the way uh, doctors speak is not so similar to lawyers, not so similar to general mm -hmm. Spanish. So that's the reason that explains that if we can actually adapt these models from general Spanish to particular professions of Spanish, let's say, you mm -hmm. will get an improved performance. So it is still natural language, but mm -hmm. in a small piece of all the natural yeah, space. For sure, I was just, uh, <laughs> just joking with you. Uh, I loved your talk. Um, very nice analogy with transportation at the beginning which, uh, and your use of or, or explanation of reduction of cognitive effort and the trend that we're on. So that helped us to, to understand greatly what you were talking about. And that was great. And, I, and you didn't speak like a lawyer at all. You were very clear. So <laughs> well, very good. I congratulate you. And it reminded me a little bit of the uh, story of Van Halen. I don't know if you remember that story of Van Halen and the m and I'm, I'm not sure I don't. Okay, you, you know Van Halen is the, the rock band, mm -hmm. famous rock band. And uh, they used to tour and do very, very big tours. And at the events, for each, each show that they did, required very lengthy contracts so that all of the security was in place. They were very worried about health and security and so on. And so they put into their contracts a clause which said that in each, uh, in each event, backstage, they would want a bowl of M&Ms, the little sweets. Hmm but there would be no brown M&Ms in the bowl. <laughs> they didn't say why, they just wanted to make sure there were no brown M&Ms, which seems totally uh, trivial, a bit like a diva. But actually the reasoning was that if they, would, if they found a brown M&M in the bowl, then they knew that people hadn't read their, their contract properly. And if they hadn't read the contract properly, then maybe there would be some other health thing or security thing that they hadn't taken into account. Mm. So I was reminded of that story and thinking, well, if they had maybe this natural language processing model, then someone maybe could uh, read these contracts very quickly and yeah. pick up on the brown M&Ms. Maybe we can train our models to find brown M&Ms. Yeah, yeah, who knows? <laughs> so uh, that's actually what I was going to ask you. I mean, do you think that this has a consumer usage in the future? I mean, could, me, could I, for example, scan a legal document and perhaps have that converted into a kind of plain English that I might actually understand. Could we get to that stage? Hmm. Well, I know there has been some work in trying to, tr let's say, translate for general English to simple English for mm -hmm. people that are not so proficient in the language. Yeah, maybe we could try something like that, but mm -hmm. the main issue here is always the data. 
So as you have seen in this project also, we had to manually annotate a lot of data to do, make the model do what we wanted to do. So here, I guess, I will be the same. So we'll need a lot of layers and a lot of uh, non-lawyer, let's say, journal people to actually translate from lawyer English to yeah. plain English. Maybe it could work, but yeah, I don't know. We will have to find applications. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We mentioned uh, other sectors and how each one has its own idiosyncratic way of talking. But would you say that when we talk about the law in particular, we've really identified the greatest challenge for you? Or is there something that's even more difficult to, to understand? Uh, well, about the wordings and so on, I think the law sector is difficult. But remember that I, uh, I told you we needed to apply OCR methods to actually extract the, uh, uh, the actual text from the documents. But we didn't go to the extent of getting handwritten text into the model. That's mm. another level of complexity. And I don't want to name any professions, but there are professions in which the handwriting is way more difficult to get. Yes, I so think we, we, we can all think yeah. of those, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's great. Well, Alvaro, we're almost out of time. So I want to, once again, thank you very much for, for your time. And I guess hopefully we'll be seeing you next year. I hope so. That's yeah. the trend <laughs> we're on. So Alvaro Barrero, thank you very much indeed.